Hey, how you doing? Matt Workman with Topline Engineering, hanging out with my boys from Rock Solid Machine Shop. Shoot, is it Solid Rock or Rock Solid? Solid Rock. Solid Rock <laughs> Machine Shop. Uh, just introducing ourselves, and we've been doing business for about three years. Uh, Mike and I started off in my pole barn with one machine, and I don't know how we got here, but somehow things went pretty good for us, and we've got a few more machines going. We've got CNC milling, CNC turning, manual mill, manual turn. We've got a beautiful water jet machine over here with four by eight foot capabilities for water jet in any material up to 12 inches. Um, we do a lot of fun with grinding and turning and milling. We also do engineering design. So if you've got maybe a camera system you want installed or maybe you need a whole machine, we do it all here right at 63 West 4th Street in Holland, Michigan. Just walk on in, we'll show you around, we'll get it done for you. This is Mike Paulette, my top engineer. He's gonna walk you through the rest of the way. So as you guys will see shortly in the video, uh, Steve here uh, graciously came in and is gonna help us set up our, our new grinder, get everything dressed in and uh, yeah, just get it dialed in for us. You know, we're not holding super tight tolerances, so it should, should go pretty well. Um, then yeah, if you wanna you know, show them, we got the, as Matt mentioned, we got the, the VF4. Uh, and then over here we got a couple, we got a little Tormac CNC and then a Tormac lathe over there. Um, as well as the, uh, the manual, uh, the manual lathe, which is 15 inch swing. Yeah, so making chips every day, nothing better. Uh, just purchased uh, two used pieces of equipment uh, from Vanderzeel Machinery Sales out in, um, I believe it's uh, Alta, Michigan. Um, they, uh, yeah, just a giant warehouse full of all sorts of used machinery going back to probably World War I or World War II. But uh, yeah, you know, as, as a shop, we're getting higher demand for, for more things. So we had to pick up some new equipment. Um, and then uh, Steve Barton here is going to help us fix it up. And uh, yeah, hopefully she'll be a good used use machine for us. Yeah, and in case, uh, in case you sharp, sharp eagle eyes are out there, uh, this grinder is not going to be next to the lathe permanently. Uh, we do have plans to move it, but for the time being, just to get it in and powered up, that's where, that's where we decide to put it. So, All right, well, yeah, thank you very much. Enjoy the video. Okay, we're here today uh, we're with Mike Paulette, uh, Top Line Engineering. Uh, they bought a used grinder. This is a Chevalier, and from what I've heard, uh, they make the Chevalier and the Acers in the same factory. Uh, they are different, but they are very similar. I've uh, actually ran, actually bought these Chevaliers in the past. They're very good grinders too. I like them probably as much as the Acer. But uh, they bought a used machine, and what we're going to do is we're going to try to help them set it up and check things out. But the first thing we did is we ground uh, the, just a piece of coro, because generally that's the hardest one to get a finish on. Uh, we just wanted to take a cleanup cut on that, and we wanted to just check and see where it's at. Because when this was shipped, they did not separate the table with the... Uh, usually you should have this table off so that you're not riding uh, in the truck and it's bouncing on, on your ball cage there's two ball cages under there and that wasn't there it was a kind of concern but I would just want to see how flat it was we got a nice finish and uh, the flatness uh, in in the wide traverse was out of tent and so I just showed Mike how to do a little spin grinding to check that and so it's really interesting to me that this thing come out probably less than 50 millions with the spin grind uh, after we've done that uh, on a used machine. It is worn. There's quite a bit of war on it. We'll show you a couple places. And I uh, apologize for some of the background noise, but uh, they, they got to run production over here, so. That's right. Uh, well, I'm just over here helping them set this grinder up. But one of the things that I wanted to look at was the condition of the spindle. And let's see, I gotta get this set so Adam can actually see the the dial if I can. I 
but one of the things if you can buy a used machine you want to check your spindle now I'm gonna be checking two things at once over here so uh, you got movement in the arm over here in the mechanism and if that's war you can have movement or if your spindle shot you can have some movement so I'm gonna swap places here a minute go to this side and uh, when I did this on my grinder uh, it's probably about two years old uh, when I would do this I would uh, Let's see, let me get that zeroed out a little better. Uh, I would only get a few tenths play. Uh, in this one, you can see I'm getting about uh, probably six, six, seven, something like that. Now, Mike, if you want to come in the back and push a lot of weight on the arm, because we did this earlier, and now Mike is going to be pushing uh, down on uh, the arm there so we can now hopefully just check the spindle. So I would only get a couple tenths uh, play. We're getting about four or five tenths now. So I know where the movement is. The movements within the adjusting mechanism over here is not the spindle, which I would prefer it being over here. If it's in the spindle, uh, you'd have to get a new cartridge. I don't have enough experience if you can tighten that up or not. Uh, but my concern was a lot of these machines uh, when you when you buy them used and you start grinding, you'll see a pretty crappy finish on there, and it's a wheel hop. And I believe a lot of that spindle noise, if it's a worn spindle, uh, there's pressure as your wheel comes across on the wheel, and it, it's hopping. And it looks like uh, you got just a, a ball peen hammer, a real fine ball peen hammer, and hit all over it. And really, there's not much you can do other than changing your spindle. Uh, if this is really sloppy in the back, fixing that up. And sometimes I've even uh, seen where it's been not the spindle bearing, but it's been the motor bearing in the back. Like this is a direct drive, and it would be the motor bearings that were bad. Uh, we had at one company that worked, we replaced the spindle and still had the problem. Turned out that when we replaced the, the bearings on the motor, it fixed everything up. So one of the things that we checked was that. The other thing we wanted to look at, and we don't have very good lighting over here, but uh, and we got the guard off here right now. Uh, but I can see that there, there's grit in uh, here. You got your ball cages that are riding in there. And this has uh, been a machine that's been well used. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to pull this table off. We're going to get some other grease. Uh, we're going to clean everything out good, pack it good with fresh grease. We're going to take the magnet off. We're going to grind uh, the base over here that the magnet sits on first. And then we're going to go through a process of grinding the magnet. And we'll show you how we going to end up doing that. And uh, so we're going to cut off from here. Adam's got to go out and buy some grease. And we'll get back and we'll show you some of the stages that we're going to do trying to get this set up so that this machine will work real good for the guys here. Uh, we took off the table and it's one of the common things you'll find with the shovel air it's just a sheet metal part and what this does is you have a little th thumb screw that locks your table and it just puts pressure against this part uh, and another part uh, or the base of the uh, machine and what will happen is uh, it will lock your table in well a lot of times that, that'll wear and it will come in a couple pieces so one of the nice things that uh, Mike have over here at top line they have a water jet so we're going to water jet pop these holes in and water jet uh, this uh, and then we're going to take and bend and while we got the table part we're just going to make a, a new part and so anyhow here mike is going to go he's got a program loaded and we're going to uh, let her run and adam will catch some video of it over here uh, instead of clamping the metal down uh, he just threw a bunch of weight on top of it just uh, doing this real quick and uh now these things cut amazingly fast. Just water and sand. Right now he's doing just the hose. Just amazing how fast it is. It's a 16th inch material. 
And this is a 60,000 PSI unit? Yeah, yeah. Now there you have it, really fast, those are nice machines. Yeah. What, we have, what we'll have to do now is we'll have to bend this, and let's check and see if I got our holes in a, a little bit longer. So we'll have to see, uh, we might have to cut down that side a little bit, let's look. Uh, so it was going on like this, right? So it's gonna stick out a little bit further here, so we should be okay at. So what Mike did is he burned the shim out of the same material. We got the thickness just right so that if we set this up like that, clamp the vise down, uh, we're going to just try to take a hammer and kind of gradually bend that and slide it, bend it, slide it, bend it, and uh, work it to a 90 degree angle here. Here's the part that we just uh, finished uh, water jetting. We had to elongate the holes out because we just kind of eyeballed the location on them. Uh, it's just sheet metal and all that does is ride on the grinder. Uh, here's the screw that you have. It rides in that track and what this does is it locks your table down in, in that movement for dressing the wheel. So uh, this will all work really good but now what we want to show is uh, uh, the grinder itself, they're using, uh, uh, I know it didn't come with that grease, uh, they're using a, a black molly grease. And, uh, but you can see that they have a lot of grit and the lighting's not good in here, I mean it's really dirty. I don't know if this flashlight's going to help or hinder. But we want to take and, and clean these off real good and, and with that grease packed in the center like that, that's not really good either. But so we're going to take these and clean them all up. And, I'm not a grease guy. I don't know uh, if, uh, if it's proper or not, but I've been doing this for decades. I've been using this white lithium grease number two because it's a very thin grease. It's not real thick uh, and it is kind of clingy. And some of the grease that they originally come in uh, is a real tacky, thick grease. I want a thinner film on there. And I even took with our grinder at home when it's brand new, I pulled it apart and I cleaned all the grease they had with it, repacked it with this, probably voided the warranty, but I've been doing this with great results and, and you all see the uh, precision that I've been getting out of our grinder. And so I wouldn't recommend this unless it's a used grinder and if there's grease guys out there that know that uh, uh, stuff that's going to work a whole lot better, but again I wanted it thin so that there's not a lot of build up, that there'd be protection. And uh, I used to own some Chevalier grinders just like this and uh, decades ago. And I would take them apart because we would run them 40 to 50 hours a week. I would pull them apart every year, clean the grease, clean these things out and repack them. And I had these machines for about three years, sold them to another company. And I'm sure they didn't follow through with that kind of cleaning. Uh, I went over there about 15 years later and they said them grinders were still grinding perfect. Uh, they got real good tolerances. And the only issue they had was with that uh, lock guard that you had that we just had to remake. That's the only thing. They had the similar situation that eventually wore out on them. So anyhow, whether this is the right grease or not, I don't know. I'm not a grease guy, but all I know is I got some very good results on it. And so this is what we're going to use uh, here. And so if there's some experts out there, 
You can chime in in the comment section and let us know something that might even work even better. Again, we don't want to build up so that we're riding on a film of grease that can affect the accuracy, something that's thick and chunky, but something that's got a smooth texture that's nice and light. So right now we're going to take these ball uh, tracks. Uh, we're going to take these out and we're going to start cleaning these out. And, and the thing to keep in mind too, your longer track is in the back, the shorter one is in the front. And you always want to make sure you get that straight. Okay, we got everything cleaned up pretty nice. It doesn't look like they're wore very bad in the tracks at all. And uh, so what we're going to do, we're, we're going to grease this. And one of the things that, uh, Mike, you want to hold that? You want to be careful about, uh, uh, there'll be a tendency to fill this whole gap with too much grease. You don't want to get it too too full. But I'll take it, uh, if you get it too full, and then you're going to be riding on the grease. But I want it to cover the contact areas. And so I'll just wipe it with my fingers. And then we'll take the ball cage. And what I'll do is I'll... Uh, Hit the balls with some grease. Get that smeared in there real good and try to get it to rub within that Delron or nylon or whatever kind of material that is. Uh, try to get it to ride in the grooves. Oops. We'll get this set back up the way it was where you had the uh, uh, screws, the heads of the screw pointed on top. And then I like to just run it back and forward in there a little bit, trying to get these balls to spin. It uh, yeah, it's got a nice slide to it. <laughs> Smooth, isn't it? Like right down there. What we're going to do now is we're going to flip the table over and you can see where we got uh, this big center hole and these two screw holes and that center hole will go into here in the two screw holes and that's what actually uh, will move the table back and forth and then you just have this this belt and you can see it's it's loose uh, and, the, and the reason that you have that will probably tighten it up just a little bit. You can adjust it there, but you don't want it real tight because uh, that can affect uh, the movement of the table as well. Okay, we're going to set this table on, and this is best if you get two guys. we got to get it lined up here. Uh, the one thing, we're going to try to be as gentle as we can so we're not bumping things around. It is a heavy cast iron, and so it's going to be lined up. Okay, and, and uh, maybe Mike, you can get in there and look and see where you got a wine uh, to get that lined up. Does that look good? Light. Had to get that center boss in there. Now we can tighten the two screws down. Okay, what we got right now is uh, we got the table back on. Uh, we got the belt tension adjusted, and you can see where the magnet was setting that we got a nice layer of uh, uh, corrosion and stuff that we're going to take off. So we're going to dress this table off. The part that we built, uh, this uh, thumb screw actually works, and if I tighten this down, you can see it holds that table real good. So that was kind of a nice thing that we got in there. Now I can move it freely. It was kind of nice to get that done while we had it apart. So now because I don't have a magnet on here, I'm going to have to dress this wheel off. And so I'm just going to use my mag base, put a little spacer steel on there so my diamond's higher than here. 
and now I'm holding good and tight on there because we don't have coolant I'm going to use one of the porous wheels that we have uh, they grind a lot freer and uh, generate very very little heat and so that's uh, what I want for this situation Now, one of the things that's really important when you're grinding here, one of the common mistakes I see people make is their uh, traverse in the X is too slow. You want to be spinning pretty fast because you don't want that wheel to be able to generate a lot of heat in one spot. Yeah, what we just did now was uh, we got the rough grind in there right now and I just used the sharpie marker to mark that up that way I can tell where my high and low spots are I can tell when I got a good grind on there and hopefully this will be the last time we have to dress the wheel for that we'll, we'll see this grinder is not set up with coolant so it's going to be hard to get the results that I, I would like I'm just wanting to barely touch right now and just work it in. And I can see some sparks. So this is where we're going to go from there and see what we get. And I suspect it would be lower in the middle because of the heat. And when you finish a grind, you want to go nice and easy on it. You want to ease into it. If your wheel starts getting loaded up, uh, you're going to generate heat. If you ate too big of a bite, you're going to generate heat. And it will take you forever to get this really good and super flat. Okay, we just finished grinding this out. And uh, it came out pretty good. We got a few little hops. You'll get that when you repack it with grease. If there's a little bit of, uh, of uh, particles or something in there. I've even had that on my Acer when I repacked it with grease. But it works itself out. It gets trapped and thrown out uh, uh, where... I don't get it anymore. I just have it usually when I re-grease it. I might get it a little bit. So anyhow, it's nice and flat. Uh, with this, uh, I had to grind a little deeper because in this area, because the, the new stop material we put on there, uh, I didn't catch the screw was rubbing a little bit, so we had to back the screw out a little bit. It was deflecting the table. So little things like that uh, will affect it. So what we're going to do now is we're going to put... Uh, the magnet on and we're going to grind it but we're going to start by grinding the bottom side of the magnet first we're going to take uh, these uh, precision flat stones and just hit this area real good just to make sure there's no any uh, not any high spots or nicks with them and we'll go from there Okay, well we got the uh, base of this ground and now I got the magnet, it's an electromagnet. I got it turned upside down. We're going to do the bottom of the magnet first. Now when we do the bottom of the magnet, we do not turn it on because if there's any bow or anything in that, we don't want it to pull down to this flat surface. Uh, if there's any bow, we want to take that off so you don't have the magnet on. But to keep the, the magnet from sliding around, we took... Uh, uh, the hold down clamps, now they're not pulling down on the magnet, we just got these locked down so that the magnet can't shift back and forward. I don't have to worry about it this way because there's not going to be enough speed with centrifugal force that's going to move it. So we're going to get this bottom surface ground, we'll flip it over, drain the top, and then we'll do some test cutting with some test pieces and see how flat we're getting. So you can see with the magnet off, I'm hitting over here, and I'm hitting over here, and it dips down in the middle. So my guess is there's a bow in there, and whoever ground it before probably turned the magnet on, or they never ground the bottom at all. So you can see it's quite a bit of difference there. 
We just finished grinding the bottom, and what this had, there was kind of a twist. It was high here, twice high here. It was really low in the middle over here, and so we had to take about two thousandths total to get it off. And uh, that was after running the stones on the other side to make sure that there was nothing uh, sticking up. Now these are the precision uh, bench stones. Uh, that you see a lot of YouTubers uh, are now using. Uh, that uh, when I first saw them was from one of Robin Renzini's videos. But I like to just rub them across there and make sure there's no burrs whatsoever. And what we'll do is we'll flip this over and uh, we'll set it up. And the last thing we got to do uh, is grind that uh, that side, uh, the magnetic side. One of the things that people do, uh, they Sometimes they'll spray a CRC, a WD-40 on the bottom and try to prevent that corrosion and stuff. I never do. I just put it bare metal to bare metal. If I got that surface flat and I got this surface flat, uh, I never have a problem. I took mine off after two years and you saw a little bit of staining. But I mean, it was good. The surfaces that was contacting, it was good. So if you got your surfaces flat, and if you use an oil-based coolant and mix properly, I never have a problem with that corrosion. The only time I've had trouble with the corrosion, uh, corrosion on uh, these surfaces was when I'm using synthetic coolants. So uh, the other thing when I mix my coolants, as you can tell from some of the videos, I always use uh, uh, a steam distilled water, uh, and that uh, helps out a lot. Uh, the coolant never turns rancid on me. I've had it in that machine for over a year. And no smell, no problem. I'd have to change it just because it was just getting uh, discolored a little bit and it was getting kind of thick. So anyways, we're going to just flip this over. We're not going to put anything on the bottom. What I'm going to do is wipe off these surfaces, make sure there's nothing on them. couple things I can feel it's real flat I, I like the feel of it uh, but I was just moving around in case I had any little lint any specks of dust or whatever uh, it would wipe off and now with this grinder I know my travel I only have about probably less than a quarter inch on both sides so it's really important to get that lined up well so that uh, I don't have problems with that one of the other things you want to be careful about when you put these clamps on uh, if you over tighten them, it's going to create problems. So basically what you want to do is you want to get one uh, just snug really good, not super tight. Uh, when you tighten something like that, you got a pressure point down there and you start distorting things here anyways. So you just want to get it, uh, like I say, definitely tight enough that the part's not going to move on you. Yeah, we're about a half dial big in the middle. Like I said, I'm going to get this one tightened down snug. I'm not going to go super tight, but I just want it tight enough that it's going to hold in place. And this one I'm going to tighten up not near as tight. I want that just to be kind of uh, barely snug. And the reason that I want that, and it looks like it moved everything on me, so... There we go. So now I got this one tighter than this one. Uh, this one just a real good firm snug, almost tight. This is a loose snug. And the reason I want that, especially if you're in an uncontrolled environment, when you have the temperature change, this steel will grow or contract depending on uh, the temperature. So if you have both of these tightened down real tight, one thing you're going to get is distortion under the clamping areas. The other thing is when, uh, if the temperature starts growing, uh, this is going to bow up in the middle and your magnet won't be flat. If you have this set right, what will happen is as this uh, expands, it will slide on the surface as it contracts, it slides without bowing. And so that's one reason why you want to have this one, like I say, just uh, snug heavy, 
This one, snug light. Now when I grind the magnet, I like to grind it with full magnet on because this is flat now. I don't have to worry about it if there's any bowl sucking down on the magnet. I want full magnet on because I grind most of the time with full magnet on. Okay, what we got a wear pattern on this magnet right now. We're touching here and we're touching here and we're low in the middle. And that's very typical on a magnet that's not been dressed uh, because what will happen is uh, you have your part over here, you turn your magnet off, you slide it off, and a lot of times you get a wear pattern in here. But because your work's in the middle, that's typically where your wear is. If you want to get max life out of them, uh, practice putting your parts three different spots, keep the wear uh, a little more even. Also try to pull your part off rather than slide it off if you can. Yeah, we're pretty much finished where we're going to go today on this. We have a low spot right here, and I know that's going to take another hour just to get out without coolant. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the, the precision stones on this magnet. We just finished ground, grinding it. Uh, so it, it's cleaned up all except for that little area. It has a lot of deep scratches, and uh, so I'm going to just take these precision stones because they will really bear out uh, how well this grinder works. You'll see if it's a real bad finish. You'd see that right away. And uh, with this one, it doesn't look bad at all. Uh, so for the age of this machine and the condition of it, I'm quite impressed uh, with the finish that we're having on there. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna take, uh, let's see, where's that little block we had? We're going to take this little block and we're just going to do a test cut on that and we're going to just see how flat it comes out when we uh, before we did everything it was actually pretty good we had uh, pretty much zero cross had a tenth in one direction and we'll see how good it comes out now and the reason we're not going to worry about this right now the machine uh, was talking with mike and they're going to actually be moving it to a different area and I told them uh, that that's when we'll probably focus on grinding it and getting it really good and flat. And without coolant, it's really hard. It's hard to get a magnet flat with coolant. Without coolant, it's really hard. And maybe we can work something out at that time, at least temporary, where we can uh, flood that and get his magnet real good for them. But uh, their tolerances, they're not going to be working in the tolerances that I do. Uh, I believe they just needed stuff for plus or minus five tenths. And I think this is going to work out perfect for them. And uh, they bought it used, and so I'm sure they got a good price on it. Yeah, one of the reasons that they'll be moving the grinder is because they got their lathe over here and they want to keep it there. But if you got an inexperienced person grinding over here and you got a lathe hand over here, the lathe hand is in the kill zone, so they got to move the grinder. Don't want some of those bad accidents. You end up throwing a block off of there, and that guy standing on that end, he's going to be changing his shorts a lot or dead, one of the two. A little heavier touch off than I wanted, but well. Come back across it and let it cool down for just a little bit. And we'll just try to take a blank pass on there because I know it's going to be low in the center. I can just tell because those sparks are just too much. And what you can do, uh, usually you'll feel some cold breeze coming under the wheel on that side. If you leave your part over there, uh, it can cool it off. And I can I can actually feel the heat in the part a little bit. So. Touched off a little heavier than what I wanted. I'm used to using my digital. It's harder to read on the, the numbers over there. So we're actually even a little heavier than what I wanted on this cut. But we'll, we'll take it and see what we get. 
finish is looking really nice. We're grinding coal roll and grinding soft coal roll. It's hard to get a good finish, so I'm actually quite impressed with the finish we get right now. It's it's real nice. We'll just come back with a blank pass and see if we're taking anything else off. You can see sparks, you're taking material off. You can actually hear it grind, you're taking material off. But those sparks that we're getting, I bet you're less than 10, 20 millions. Barely there. But if you're wanting to dial something in and get it super flat, uh, blank passes are uh, definitely the way to go. You notice how fast I was going in the... Uh, uh, X traverse over there uh, and again you want that speed a uh, common mistake people make they go too slow and then they wonder why they got these burn streaks in the part they need to really ramp that up and uh, uh, that way the less contact the wheel has because I'm going faster over there the less heat that's in the part I tried to take less than what a uh, tenth on the dial we'll see if we're even making sparks Okay, we've got just a little bit. Okay, here more. Yeah, that's a nice light cut right there. That's what I was shooting for on the other side. The other test that uh, Mike I have to do is you have to grind the block, and measure it, and then uh, grind off uh, and try to get like a thousandth more uh, slowly, check it and make sure that uh, he's getting a thousandth for a thousandth on the reading and then that way he can kind of check his lead screw because though that's one of the other things in the z-axis if I had to hold the thickness of this part I have to have uh, the mechanism that I can depend on. If I uh, read five tenths high on my indicator and I got it set up right I want to be able to hit that dial and hit five tenths and, and be right on and if that's not the case it's not the end of the world you just have to map it out you, if you get say hey if I wind a thousandths I get three quarters of a thousand that's the best way to go and then you always know you got more to take off uh, the problem you run is if you wind a thousandths on your dial and you get a thousand and a half mm -hmm. uh, if you map it out you can still compensate and at that point you can either fix it or think about uh, getting a digital in the Z-axis and that will take care of that problem too.